Hey guys, it's Alex and welcome to the Geeks Table. Today we shall talk about Samsung Viewfinity S9, the new 5K display that Samsung rolled out in August of 2023. Since everyone was happy with the long and thorough review of Apple's Studio Display, I decided to do the same with the Samsung screen. So we shall start with the unboxing, but the major part will be an in-depth review. I shall cover the capabilities of Samsung Viewfinity S9 and how it stands against Apple Studio Display. Feel free to use the chapters, otherwise let's open the box. The box itself is more narrow compared to the Apple Studio Display box and I guess the reason is that Apple Studio Display has the stand attached to the screen, while in Samsung they are two different parts. And also, unlike Apple Studio Display box, the Samsung box doesn't have a handle, so carrying it from the store might be tricky. So if you have a MacBook or a Mac, you might want a 5K screen because the image from any Mac scales better on a 5K screen rather than on a 4K screen. And there are not so many options. So we have Apple Studio Display, we have the Samsung, we have an option from Dell, and we have LG 5K, which is rather old right now. So if we are on a tight budget, I would say go with the LG 5K. So there are a lot of uh, options on eBay or like those secondhand markets. But if we have quite a bigger budget, I would say, then we have this option and Apple Studio Display. And they have the same price tag. And in this case, I would say, before I do any review, like as of now, my opinion is if I want just a screen and I don't want to go outside of Apple ecosystem, I would just go and buy the Apple Studio Display. But I'm curious if Samsung can convince me otherwise. And secretly, I really want it to convince me because an alternative is always a good thing. So give me a week, which will be like half a second for you, and I will be right back with my thoughts. All right, I'm back and super excited to share my findings. A quick verdict. This is a very Samsung product. And if you're a fan of Samsung devices, you'll feel at home. But if you're a fan of Apple stuff, there is something else waiting for you. First of all, let's cover the external stuff. Samsung Viewfinity S9 comes with a height adjustable stand. The screen floats just 4.5 cm above the table in its lowest position, and it goes up to 17 cm above the table at its highest. The standard stand holds Apple Studio Display at 11.5 cm above the table, and the height adjustable stand can go up to 22.3 centimeters. I obviously don't have one, so let's use our imagination. Both screens cannot be turned left or right, unfortunately, so you'll have to rotate the whole stand. Vertically, however, we do have some freedom. Either you want it to be bent up or a little bit down. Of course, you can rotate it in 90 degrees in both ways, However, there is no gyroscope inside, so it won't turn the image automatically. You have to do it manually in the settings. Just for the record, Apple Studio Display, even the version with the stand, can do that. Just turn it in the right way. If we do it counterclockwise, nothing happens. But if we do it clockwise, it works. Now the screen bezels. They are okay, but their thickness is inconsistent. Apple Studio Display has all of them of equal size, 1.5 cm wide. So it does look like a perfect frame and, well, I mean, I do like symmetry. In Samsung Qfinity S9, the frame is 0.6 cm, which is excellent, but that's only on the screen's left, top and right sides. On the bottom, however, it's 1.3 cm. Speaking of the materials, the bottom part is made of metal, because it has to be heavy, but everything else is plastic. This, 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 everything is plastic. On the video, the finishes look the same, but once you touch them, you'll feel the difference right away. I don't have a habit of touching the screen very often, but Apple's metal enclosure just feels better to me. Probably not a big deal, but worth noting. Oh, and I found a benefit of Apple Studio Display having a non-detachable stand. It either doesn't wobble at all or stops wobbling almost immediately. 
thanks to the firm construction, I guess. Samsung Qfinity S9 seems to have a stronger wobble, and it might be vital for the productivity if you have such a standing desk as I do. And if we think about the workaround, all I can say is use a Visa stand. Vufinity has a standard 100-100 Visa mount, and you'll need four 10mm M4 screws. If you plan to hang it on the wall, keep at least 4cm gap for the cables to bend. And kudos to Samsung to include an L-shaped power connector. Also, it's detachable, yes. Here is also a useful weight breakdown for those planning the cable management and applying the VIS amount. Feel free to pause the video and take a screenshot, and I'll move to the ports and cables. So on the back, it has four USB-C ports. One of them is the Thunderbolt 4 port, and that's the one to connect your device to. The other three are USB 3 ports, and they don't transfer video signals. If your device doesn't have a USB-C video output, a mini display port is waiting for you. But you'll have to buy a cable separately, because this is what's in the package. A 1 meter Thunderbolt 4 cable, a power brick with a 1.5 meter cable and an L-shaped connector, and also 1.5 meter 2 pin power cable, which is also L-shaped. I should note though that this is what we get in Germany, so the shapes, voltage and plugs may be different in your country. Oh, and also it comes with a remote. Same as the latest Apple TV remote, it has a USB-C for charging the internal battery. But unlike the Apple TV remote, this one is made of plastic. And I'm not too fond of its feel. I also assume that the dedicated buttons for the online streaming services may be adjusted to the local market, so you might have a different layout. There is also this plastic thingy in the box. It's a webcam with a built-in microphone. And if you're obsessed with the privacy, just leave it in the box. Otherwise, snap it to the back of the screen. It has a magnetic cap over here, but unfortunately, it doesn't turn it off or on. It's just a cap. We'll talk about the webcam later, don't worry, but now let's talk about the connectivity. And while testing the Apple Studio Display, I connected different devices to it. And it was a pure lottery. Some would support 5K, some would ignore the sound, some would limit to Full HD, some would support camera, some wouldn't. So I'm expecting the same level of fun with the Samsung screen. First, the most easy yet unpleasant answer, there is no daisy chain possible here. You cannot connect one screen to Viewfinity and then Viewfinity to your other screen. It won't work. But I have some good news. What did work was an external storage connected via USB-C, a USB-C to audio jack adapter, because why not, and an Ethernet adapter. Also, I could connect my laptop to the Viewfinity S9 with just a USB 3 USB-C cable. It's not a Thunderbolt one, but the video signal kept going, and the connected USB-C devices were also visible. Of course, I could access them with the lower speeds, but at least I could do that. Apple Studio Display couldn't handle the USB 3 connection. Well, it kept the video signal, but it disabled all other connected devices. So, thank you Samsung for doing it the right way. But there is one thing I cannot thank them for. Those other USB-C ports don't have enough bandwidth and power. I decided to measure the SSD speeds, so I connected my Samsung USB-C SSDs one after another and did all the necessary measurements. And as I said in my studio display review, if you connect an SSD directly to an Intel Mac, the transfer speeds will be much better than when connected to an Apple Silicon Mac. But the speeds do improve once I connect the SSDs via the studio display, so I thought Maybe I could do the same trick here. So I connected the SSDs via Viewfinity S9 and then connected the Viewfinity S9 to my M1 Max MacBook. But unfortunately, it didn't improve the speeds at all. Moreover, it got worse. And that's an unpleasant surprise. But okay, if I can't connect fast storage to the screen, fine, I'll attach it to the laptop so I could use the USB-C ports here for charging instead, right? Right? Well, I used the same configuration as I had back with the Apple Studio Display. MacBook is charged and connected via Thunderbolt. Two iPhones are at 0% and charging from the screen. 
While Studio Display kept giving from 8 to 12 watts for each phone, Viewfinity S9 gave no more than 7.7 watt to each. In fact, it took almost twice the time to charge a single iPhone 12 Pro Max from 0 to 50% compared to the Studio Display. So I guess no fast charging for us guys. The power consumption is also something interesting to compare. In most common examples, the Samsung Viewfinity S9 consumed more power than the Apple Studio Display. But in the sleep mode, however, it looks like Samsung consumes less than a single watt per minute. But okay, the screen is the screen, so how is the image quality? And it goes without saying that I have to compare it with the Studio Display yet again. The resolution is identical as far as I can tell, so is the pixel density. Both are vibrant 27-inch 5K LCDs with a P3 color gamut support. Both are very bright, but the Samsung Viewfinity S9 seems to be a bit brighter. I never use maximum brightness, so I don't care that much, but it may affect the HDR content, and it's something you should consider if it's important to you. Samsung Qfinity S9 has a matte coating, so I'm comparing it with the Apple Studio Display that has a nanotexture gloss. Both do remove the reflection nicely, especially compared to the glossy MacBook. But some say that the nanotexture makes the text less sharp. I'm a fan of matte screens, so I'm happy with this, but if it bothers you, you should go with the Studio Display with the standard glossy option. Both screens boast having an HDR mode, and if you watch YouTube or your own HDR content, then the screen do get brighter. Studio Display does that automatically when used with macOS or iPadOS. You just open YouTube and it already knows that it can show an HDR content. Still, you have to enable it manually for the Viewfinity S9. Go into the settings and flip the switch. I wouldn't buy any of these for an HDR content, they simply don't have enough brightness for that. Better to go with the OLED TV for such case. But aside from HDR, both screens are great for color grading or photo editing, and actually Samsung wins here. You see, Studio Display is a consumer device with no settings, menus, or even a power button, so you have very limited options to calibrate it. Samsung, however, has it all enabled. So you can take a professional tool and calibrate the screen right away. It will help you to adjust the settings to your specific workflow, either photo editing or video editing or photo printing, for example. And it will also export the ICC profile, so you could reuse it with all other computers that you connect to this screen. Or you can use your smartphone to do the calibration. iPhone, Galaxy or any other Android phone will work. And in this case, you'll have to have just two things the SmartThings application installed on your phone, and quite a strong hand, because you'll have to hold your phone steadily like this for quite a bit. I would say the professional collaboration was the best just because it could be fine-tuned for my needs. And the smartphone collaboration, well, it's budget-friendly, so it kind of speaks for itself, and it's also quite good. But when it comes to color grading, calibration is not enough. You also need good lighting condition. I solved this problem with BenQ Spacebar Halo. And you probably saw this on the desks of many YouTubers, because it's pretty popular. It consists of two lights, the obvious one that shines at the desk, and the back one that shines on the wall behind the screen. And that's something that many videographers recommend. You have to grade in a dark environment with the daylight lamp behind your screen. The installation is super easy, and you can actually power it from the USB-C port of the back of the screen. It has enough power for that. And my favorite part is the controller. It's super simple, yet very cool to use. You can adjust the brightness from a tiny light to a bright one, and adjust the temperature from cold to daylight to warm. Or you can tap the automatic option so it will set the temperature to be the most neutral for the color grading based on your current surroundings. And if you want just the back, or the front, or both lights, you can switch between the modes as well. Here you can easily see the difference in the whole process. I tried to do it in a well-lit room, my eyes were fine, but it did affect the color grading. 
Then I switched to the dark room and well, the colors got better, but my eyes were so tired that this didn't work for me as well. And only this setup was ideal for both my eyes and my work. The link to the BenQ screen bar Halo will be in the description and if anyone cares, it's not affiliated. Now back to the review. As you know, this is not just a screen, it's a multimedia device. So it has speakers, a webcam and a microphone, so let's check them one by one. The speakers are located on the back of the screen and they sound okay. If you would use this screen for some business or family calls, or as a YouTube player in your living room, then it's good. Loud, flat, nothing special. But it's so far behind the studio display. Check the difference by yourself. Just for the record, there's an amplify mode in the menu along with the intelligent sound mode, but none of them could add volume to the sound. I mean, not loudness, I mean volume. English is hard. Moving on to the exciting part, the webcam and the microphone. This screen has both of them in a separate module, and it makes perfect sense. Many companies and even households are concerned about their privacy. Here in Germany, every second webcam is covered behind the shutter. So if a company decides to put the screen into a conference room, they can do that. But if suddenly they need a webcam for the meeting, they can attach it like this and it just works. Okay, now we have our webcams and I would say that the studio display camera has a more narrow camera just because I'm using the center stage and the Samsung camera has a wider angle. But actually, if I switch the center stage off, the angle will be wider on the studio display camera. And I would say, well, the center stage is good when we have like a single phase show, if you will. And the wider angle in case of Samsung is good for business meetings or family gatherings. Just give me a moment, I will switch off the lights so we'll have a more dark environment. And now I would say that the Samsung's quality is better in a dark environment, but both of the web cameras add significant layer of grain, if you will. So I would use both of them in a well-lit environment. I've also noticed after a while, in a few places, Samsung's recording from the camera would miss a frame. So we would see something like this or like this. It just is like one frame long. But if you're doing some educational materials or this recording is very important and should be good looking, maybe consider using a different webcam. Just for the record, I never had such a problem with the Apple Studio display. Mac OS has this center stage mode, so the screen can track your face and zoom out if another face moves in, but there is no way to turn it on in the Viewfinity S9. Well, unless you use the built-in operating system. But there is just Google Meet as the single application you could use it with. Let's move to the microphone, and here I've noticed that when I connect this to the display, the mic sensitivity is set to the middle, but it's set to the maximum when I connect the Viewfinity S9. So let's do a fair comparison. All right, so this is the test of two microphones, the Apple Studio Display and the Samsung Viewfinity S9. So I removed all the sound panels, so the sound should be more natural. Both displays are at the desk, I'm sitting in front of it. So this is probably like the most natural, sound flow that you will get while being on a FaceTime call or through Zoom or Skype. So yeah, this is like, these are the normal environments. Now, give me just a moment, I will open the window to emulate the background noise. And while I'm going, so you can check, so how the microphones pick up the talks like three to five meters away. So yeah, here I'm opening the window. And let's see how the microphones pick up the background noise. I'm going back 
to my desk. And yeah, I'm keeping the talk going. And let's see if we can pick up the, the cars going, passing by, the children noise, the birds. So yeah, this is how both microphones filter out the background noise. And yeah, I think we can wrap it up now. To me, Apple's mic sounds more natural, but Samsung does it louder. So whatever you prefer, I guess. All right, here goes my favorite part. We shall try connecting all possible gadgets to the screen and understand what works and what doesn't. Let's start with the MacBook Pro with Thunderbolt 4 port. It obviously works and produces a 5K 60Hz image. You may turn on the HDR mode in the settings, but then the whole screen is switched to HDR, unlike Apple Studio Display, where it can do both depending on the content. Once you have the HDR on, you can refresh the YouTube page, for example, and it will show the updated options for the HDR videos. We can select the microphone and the speakers of the Viewfinity S9 as the audio input and the audio output, but surprisingly, we can't change the brightness or the volume. To do so, we have to use either the remote or the joystick behind the screen. The webcam also works fine and the Mac can offer the portrait mode for it, which is nice if you don't want to share the mess around you. And I've also tested the USB-C ports on the back of the screen by connecting the audio jack adapter, the Ethernet adapter and an SSD. And MacBook saw all of them without a problem. This screen supports AirPlay, so you can make it work as a wireless screen with the audio, but it will be limited to Full HD. And believe me, you don't want to use Full HD on a 5K screen. Next, I tried connecting Microsoft Surface Pro 7. It doesn't have a Thunderbolt port, so I just gave it a try and it worked. The reason is that the USB-C port of the Surface Pro 7 supports the DisplayPort protocol, so we can still use the screen all right. It produces the same 5K 60Hz image, and even the HDR option is available. The microphone, webcam and speakers work just fine, and we can adjust the volume inside the system. Still no brightness adjustment though. All the USB accessories were visible by the surface as well, but do note that we fall back to the USB 3 here. So when you try using all of the accessories at once, it may affect the speed. There is also a way to connect the Surface Pro wirelessly, and at first it wasn't a pleasant experience at all. I had to connect it four times and then restart both the screen and the Surface Pro 7 to make it work. It casts the screen in Full HD by default, but you can set it up to 1600p. Audio also works, but no web camera, of course. Now let's try the iPad Pro. I doubt that you'd buy a 5K screen for an iPad, but we are trying all possible configurations, so why not? Of course, I can mirror the screen in the old-fashioned way, but I can also attach the keyboard and enable the stage manager. In this mode, Viewfinity S9 can be used as an external screen. It supports 5K 60Hz and allows switching between three modes – larger text, default and more space. It basically does some UI scaling depending on the needs. HDR is turned on by default, but I suggest you to go to the settings and switch to the SDR instead. And while we are in the settings, there is no way to adjust the brightness and volume from the iPad Pro. We have to use the remote for that. The USB hub works fine. The iPad Pro recognized the Ethernet, the audio adapter and the storage. And since I've updated the iPad to the latest iOS 17, I could use the external camera with the iPad apps. Well, I say apps, but it actually works just with FaceTime now. All other apps have to be updated in order to use it. Overall, I think it was a pleasant experience, not ideal, but good enough. But let's try a smaller iPad, the iPad mini. It doesn't have a stage manager mode, so the only mode we have is the simple mirror mode. In this case, we get a 1440p, 60Hz and no HDR. The functionality is relatively poor, no webcam support, no microphone, no way to adjust the volume or brightness. 
On the bright side, however, it recognizes the external storage connected to the screen and the Ethernet adapter. The iPads can be connected to the screen via AirPlay, the same way as the Macs, but again, we are stuck on Full HD limitation here. Next, I've connected the latest iPhone 15 Pro Max. Thank goodness it has USB-C. And it was quite an impressive experience. 4K, 60Hz, with HDR supported. No functionality of the screen though, but a working Ethernet, SSD and audio adapter. Alright, after all, this is the display made by Samsung, so let's connect a Samsung phone. I have a Galaxy Fold 5 here, and once I connect it, it offers me to turn on the DeX mode, which stands for the desktop experience. The image is 4K 60Hz, not 5K, and what's interesting is that it works in SDR mode by default. But once you open YouTube with an HDR video, the screen understands that and switches itself to an HDR mode. I'm also glad that I can adjust the volume of the screen from the phone, but I still cannot change the screen's brightness. Neither the external camera nor the microphone is visible by the phone, which is a bit sad and strange given that it's the same manufacturer. The USB-C hub works without a problem though, so the SSD, the Ethernet adapter and the audio adapter work just fine. Of course it supports the wireless connection, but it's limited to Full HD with audio, so use it only as a last resort. I tried to connect other Android phones to the screen, Google Pixel 7 in this case, but they wouldn't do anything. The device refused to identify the screen, either being wired or wirelessly paired. Unlike Apple Studio Display, this screen has an alternative port to connect to. If your device doesn't have a USB-C, you can use the mini display port. I played around with it and this is what you'd get, depending on what you connect it to. The image goes up to 5K 60Hz with HDR. Of course, the output should support this kind of resolution and mode. Audio is supported as well. No way to change the volume or the brightness of the screen from the device. No USB-C hub, no webcam or mic, and no charging. But what if we want to connect an HDMI device to the screen or something with a lightning port? In this case, you should buy something like this. It's an active adapter which converts an HDMI signal to a DisplayPort signal. The HDMI goes to your device, like Apple TV, PlayStation 5 or anything else, and the other side is connected to the USB-C cable of the screen. So this is not a promotion, I can just confirm that this cable definitely works. But if you wish to buy another one, go for it. Just check that it says that it's an active adapter and it has the DisplayPort 1.2 support. So after connecting PS5 to the screen, it sets the resolution to Full HD by default. But we can go to the settings and get the resolution up to 1440p in 60Hz. Both HDR and SDR are supported by the way, so you can get a really nice picture. The sound is also transmitted to the screen and the volume can be adjusted from the console. When I connected the Apple Studio Display in the same way, there was no sound supported, so this is quite an improvement. Then I tried connecting the Apple TV 4K in the same way and got almost the similar results. The default resolution was 720p, but I could change it in the settings to 1440p 60Hz or even 4K in 30Hz. I could use both SDR and HDR, which is cool, and again, I could get the sound working. I'm making a big deal of it because Apple Studio Display couldn't. Out of curiosity, I tried connecting an old Chromebook via this dongle. And well, it's an old machine, so I didn't expect much. But I got the Full HD, 60Hz, and the sound working. And that's more than enough for this machine. As for the Lightning devices, we have to put one more adapter on the top, the HDMI to Lightning. And as every Lightning adapter, it requires some external power, which we have to provide as well. Personally, I wouldn't take such a hard path if I were you, but we are having fun here. So when connecting the iPhone 12 Pro Max, I got Full HD, 60Hz, with no HDR or other features, but again, it supports sound. In the same configuration, Apple Studio Display just stayed muted. 
But jokes aside, if you decide to connect your Lightning iPhone to the Viewfinity S9, do use AirPlay. It will still be Full HD, but you won't have to have this crazy dongle hell construction. <laughs> and that makes me think why the studio display doesn't have AirPlay. Alright, we covered everything except just one but huge thing – the software of the screen itself. Of course, most of the features require the internet connection, so the screen can be connected over Wi-Fi. But it also recognizes the Ethernet adapter once connected to the USB-C port on the back. It also understands the USB-C to audio jack adapter, if you wish to watch something in your super expensive wired headphones. And on top of that, you can connect your storage over the USB. I've tested watching 4K HDR clips from a hard drive – yes, not SSD, a hard drive – and it works just fine. And it even supports files with subtitles and multiple audio tracks. If you wish it to be the real TV, then it won't work, unfortunately. There is no TV module built in. But it can mirror the real TV over Wi-Fi. The OS here is not Android, so don't expect to see the Play Store here. However, the marketplace here has lots of apps. Most, if not all of them, are typical TV apps that stream online videos from some servers requiring a subscription. Among them there is Netflix, Disney+, Apple TV and Music, Spotify, YouTube, Plex, and a web browser. So plenty of them. There is also a version of Google Meet here, and that's probably the only app that can work with this webcam internally. And that's probably the only way to experience the analog of the center stage mode on the screen. If you're unhappy with the webcam or simply lost it because it's so tiny, no problem. You can use the SmartThings app and share the webcam of your smartphone or tablet with a screen. iPhones and iPads are also supported, and that's kind of cool. Aside from that, SmartThings can be turned into a TV remote. So there is no need to search for the real one. And that's a common case knowing how tiny that remote is. And if you're an Android user, you'll have this panel on your screen with some quick actions. So you can literally turn the display on and start casting the phone screen in a couple of taps. Speaking of casting the screen, by the way, the Viewfinity S9 obviously supports multi-view. You can put two sources either side by side or in the usual picture-in-picture -picture mode. But I found a limitation here. The screen has a Thunderbolt connection and a DisplayPort connection. So I decided to connect two wires to two laptops. But Multiview would accept only one wired source. So the other one could be the webcam, it could be the internal app like YouTube, or it could be another device. But the another device had to be connected wirelessly. So no two wired sources at the same time. On the good side, you can use the remote to switch between audio sources and adjust the volume separately. But it won't mix them together, unfortunately. Aside from that, that's quite a good implementation. Alright, this was a lot, and I hope it helps you to decide if you'd buy the Samsung Qfinity S9 or you'd go with something else. Samsung impressed me with the functionality, but it's still too expensive for just a screen, even a smart screen. So probably it's worth waiting for a Black Friday or another sale. And if you haven't seen my Apple Studio display review yet, you may do it right now or click on the other video that YouTube suggests to you. As always, hit a like if this video was useful to you and consider subscribing. It's been Alex and see you at the Geeks table. Bye-bye.